Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, November 20th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from Next Goal Wins, editor Tom Eagles. It's often the way, I think, with Taika's films that the second act is quite fluid. You know, sometimes it'll start out quite episodic and it's driven by comedy. And then you need to find a way to arrange those scenes to best tell the story. For me, anytime I work with a director, I treat them as a genre and I try and figure out what the tone of that genre is. And that was part of the brief, was to make the movie feel more Taika. I mean, the first time I met Taika, he was just in my house. He was sleeping on my couch. There was those kind of days of loose, wilder partying. And he was also a, a dude who I think, you know, in his early days, he's making a lot of movies and doing his comedy and sleeping on a lot of couches. So I think probably a lot of people have that story. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, November 20th already. The holiday season is at hand. I'm not ready for that. Then again, I'm rarely ready for anything. But I am ready to do some editing talk with you. Well, actually, we'll be with Tom Eagles, but you get to listen. Tom is making his third appearance on the show. He was last on to talk about editing James Samuel's directorial debut, The Harder They Fall. The first time he was on was to talk about Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit. That work bagged an Oscar nomination and an Ace Eddie Award for Mr. Eagles. Tom is once again reunited with Taika Waititi for his new film, Next Goal Wins. Alongside editors Nick Monsoor, Nat Sanders, and Yana Gorskaya, Tom helped shape Taika's film about the legendarily bad American Samoa soccer team. Or football team. Let's just go with football. If you feel like you've heard of a film called Next Goal Wins before, that is because there was a documentary of the same name that came out in 2014. It was about Dutch-American football coach Thomas Rongen's efforts to lead the American Samoan national football team, as I mentioned, one of the worst football teams in the world, to qualify for the 2014 FIFA World Cup. So you got a pretty good underdog sports story there. But there are also a few more elements that Taika, Tom, and the rest of the team flesh out in their film. I could tell you about all that, but why would I do that when we have editor Tom Eagles on hand to give it to you straight? But before he does, let's take a slight left turn and talk about the folks who helped to sponsor this chat with Tom, Extreme Music. Since 1997, Extreme Music has been the ones film and TV makers have turned to for the very best in production audio. So it would be wise if you got on over to ExtremeMusic.com for your next project, where you can check out their enormous catalog of production music from the best of the best. Best like who, you ask? Well, best like Quincy Jones. Best like Hans Zimmer. Best like Next Goal Wins composer Michael Giacchino. All you gotta do is hit their search engine for things like instrumentation, genre, speed, vocals, era, mood, composer, and any other thoughts that come to mind. The tracks you get back from that search are available in different links with whatever instrumentation you need. All of that power in one simple-to-use website where you can do all of the licensing online or get a little help from one of their reps at an office near you. So the next time you need the best production audio out there, check out ExtremeMusic.com. Now then, time to hit the pitch with our special guest today. From Next Goal Wins, here's editor Tom Eagles. Like the first like, 20 seconds. You ever done that? You get chatting like we are now, and you forget about stuff like that. <laughs> well, Tom, the last time we spoke, you were working with James Samuel on The Harder They Fall, which was his directorial debut, and obviously the first time you worked with him, because it's his first movie. You have another movie with him coming out next year, but the movie we're talking about today, Next Goal Wins, you did with Taika Waititi, someone you have a lot of experience working with, going back, I think, almost 10 years on films like Hunt for the Wilder People and Jojo Rabbit, of course. How does working with Taika with whom you already have a lot of history, compared to working with a director who's new to you, regardless of whether they're a first-time director or not? Are there certain aspects of the process that are just faster? Can you be more direct with one another in terms of feedback? How does that work with Taika compared to any other director? Yeah, I think it is faster. I don't know if there's a shorthand, but I think I'm probably bolder with Taika than I might be with someone I'm working with for the first time. Like you said, James and I have just done our second film, and I'm pretty bold with him too. But you know, with Taika, I think it pays to just put your best foot forward and try and make the cut as good as you believe it can be. You know, so sometimes even on a first assemble, I'll drop scenes, which we will have talked about beforehand. And on this film, I was coming in a little bit later. So the people had tried a variety of things. So it sort of felt like low risk, like I could just try whatever I wanted to try. And either he likes it or he doesn't like it. But I think working with him, I've learned that you just have to make a lot of offers. 
in the same way that he works with actors and, and people throw in a lot of improv, I think as an editor, you just have to keep throwing ideas at the wall until something sticks for him. And then when he likes something, he'll pick it up and run with it. Well, as you said, you came into this partway through part of the process of working with Taika as an editor seems to be mastering the art of collaboration. He frequently has the material passed through the hands of multiple editors, most often you and Yana Griskaya. So whether you're receiving a version of a cut from another editor or passing one of your own onto another editor, are there things that you try and do to make it a more seamless process? I mean, I always try and talk to the other editors or editor, unless there had been a few. So Nat was really the person who I tried to collaborate with. He'd been on just before me. And I actually asked that they bring him back onto the movie because I only had a window. Also, just because I think five editors is kind of crazy. So... <laughs> And I just tried to keep up communication with him. And, you know, you're there for fresh eyes and you kind of want to make your own impressions first. But at some point, it's good to go back to the other editors and, and ask, you know, is there anything that you just couldn't quite nut out? Any challenges that you foresee if I go down X route or Y route? You know, am I wasting my time? So communication is key in that regard. From a practical standpoint, joining a project in process. Do you basically move into the facility where a post is already underway? Were you home remoting in? Were you at home with a local copy of the project and media? How does it work from a technical standpoint to jump in midway? I mean, it can work a lot of ways. I've done it a lot of ways. For this one, yes, I just moved into Digital Vortex in Echo Park. They had a couple of suites. I mean, Aaron, who was assisting, was working from home. So it was really just me in a, <laughs> in a little office in a wing of Vortex with a, you know, a couple of other productions going on around me. But yeah, I just kind of picked up and ran with what was there. So seven years prior to this film, there was a documentary of the same name called Dex Goal Wins, obviously. And it told the story of the soccer coach, Thomas Rongen, trying to help the historically bad American Samoa soccer team qualify for the FIFA World Cup. And when I say historically bad, for people that don't know, they once lost a match to Australia 31 to nothing. So no small feat to get them to qualify. Did you watch that documentary as part of your preparation to work on the feature? And whether you did watch it or not, what other things might you do to prep for getting up to speed on the material? I did watch the doco. It was probably one of the few bits of prep I did because I was coming in late. I didn't have a lot of time. I actually met those guys. The, the, the first time I became aware of this project was way back when we were cutting Hunt for the Wilder People. We were in Hawaii and these two British guys turned up and I remember shooting pool with them for a bit and I was kind of like, I couldn't figure out who they were or why they were there, but they turned out to be the directors of the documentary and they'd come to pitch Taika to do his version, his take on this story. I remember our producer at the time saying, oh, you know, he's got so many projects, it'll never probably happen, but um, flash forward, I don't know how many years, five, seven, and here we are. But yeah, I watched the doco I wasn't too attached to the particularities of the story, but I wanted to get a vibe of who Thomas Rongen was and who Jaya was. They're all based on real people, so it felt like it was at least respectful to try and find out who those real people were, whether we were going to adhere to that or not. I think you need to know the material and know what you're dealing with. I know you're so close to Taika. Will he send you a script to get your notes or your thoughts on what scenes might end up living or dying in the final product? He has in the past, but not this one. I mean, we were working on Jojo Rabbit when he was prepping this. And then I had another film back in New Zealand that I was going on to. And, you know, I think sometimes when you're in the thick of it, like I, I just couldn't read another script whilst I was cutting that movie. And I don't think I went back and read the script. You know, when I got on to Next Goal Wins, I was really interested in what the material was. There was a lot of improv, and obviously I had the cuts that had already been done of the film, so I looked at a bunch of them. I don't remember actually sitting down and reading the script. Well, I mentioned the documentary. The film opens with what appears to be archival footage of the real American Samoa soccer team. Was this from the documentary? Was it sourced from somewhere else, or was this new footage made to look like archival? It was from the documentary. I don't know where they got it from. I guess they got it, you know, from whoever was screening the game at the time, ESPN or someone. And then we match cut to Nikki Salapu, our version of Nikki, played by Uli, just for the last kind of goal or couple of goals, maybe. So it starts out kind of wide and then you kind of 
you get close and you see him collapse on the ground, head in hands, and that's going to kind of bookend the movie. So it was important to see our Nikki towards the end of that montage. So in a sports movie or an action movie, you're going to have these set pieces. But sometimes within a film, you have what I call editorial set pieces in the form of self-contained commercials or PSAs or training videos, some kind of short form content that's often there to provide exposition or color in lieu of longer dialogue based scenes. And this movie, there's at the beginning, there's a uh, welcome to American Samoa travel video. Now, something like that, you might think if you're trying to tighten a movie, it's an obvious candidate for, well, we don't really need this. But it does add both comedy and also context to the movie. Tell me about whether or not you worked on that element and was it ever a candidate for, maybe we don't need this. I did not. I, I thought it was brilliant. I think it's the work of Nick Monso, who's the first editor on, possibly went through a few permutations. There was definitely longer versions of it. You know, I think people don't really know a lot about Samoa. don't know the difference between Western Samoa and American Samoa. So it was kind of useful to have like a little intro and to do that in a comedic way. So, I mean, everything's a candidate for cutting, but I think we probably just cut that down. I don't think there was ever a time where I seriously considered dropping it. Taika opens the film almost as if he's going to be the narrator. Like we see him first and he's setting the film up. And then we do hear him again later and then see him on screen as a priest involved in the story. Talking about versioning, was there ever a version with more of him in it? Uh, yeah, I definitely remember that being talked about. I think we tried a few versions, but it just felt like it dropped you out of the story and the characters that you're really interested in. You know, Jaya and Thomas and Tavita. All of Taika's stuff, you know, he did a lot of improv just in that one location. And the temptation is because it's so funny is that you want to use it, but it wound up not really serving the story. It pulled us out too much, you know, to see it in this kind of third person narrator view. So it was better in a way, I think, to bookend the movie. But like you say, you know, he does come back in the middle and we kind of come to realize that he's a real character in the film, you know, with this kind of biblical parable that he's telling over um, scenes of Thomas being kind of baptized. It was quite fun. You know, a lot of people watch that and go, oh, I wish there was more Taika. That's the right response for me is to leave them wanting more. Well, that was me. I wish there was more Taika. But <laughs> you're right. It's probably made for a better movie. The way you introduce the character of Thomas is in one of my favorite scenes in the film, what I call the five stages of grief scene. Yeah. With an overhead projector, they basically walk him through the five stages of grief that he is playing out as he's finding out that he's not going to be able to continue on working in the way he's wanted to. And he's going to have to go and help this team. And it's just a very funny scene. And I'd just love to know about how you put it together. Yeah, I mean, that, that was another one that had a lot of permutations because there was a lot of great improv from, uh, from everyone, really. But in the original long version, we definitely went through all five stages of grief in some <laughs> detail. And it was really funny, but it held the story up so much. You know, that scene had actually been shot as a pickup originally you know, the story just started with the Samoan team and you didn't meet Thomas until he stepped off the plane. And it became apparent that we needed to know a little bit about who Thomas was. And we did more more work on that front through the movie, but to get that scene in to kind of establish where he's at in his life and his career was, was really important. Something else I recall from when we talked about How Do They Fall, you had put on social media a page of handwritten notes that you had done for a scene. It was really fascinating to see how you were thinking your way through the scene before you went after it. And something else I was able to see recently that you shared with me was you have a corkboard or a wall board with your scenes broken down on the board so you can physically move them around if you want. You use this method to pitch different structures for the film that you would send to Taika. Just tell me about that process of how you do that and why you do that and what you get out of doing it that way. That was one of the first things I did when I came in was get the court board going because I find it really useful to to be able to abstract out the film on the wall. You know, it, it just kind of breaks you out of the strictures of what every scene currently is and gives you kind of these little units of meaning that can be reshaped and reordered to find the, the best story. So I played around with a lot of structures for the second act 
it's often the way I think with Taika's films that the second act is quite fluid. You know, sometimes it'll start out quite episodic and it's driven by comedy, and then you need to find a way to arrange those scenes to best tell the story. Well, knowing he works that way, what is your approach? Do you look at a scene and think, regardless of what I have here, what is Taika's intent with this scene and how do I get him there? Or do you just look at the material and see what's the best performances? I think that's the starting point. I think, you know, I never come in going, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to restructure everything and rework everything. I think you kind of look at what's there and you assume that the script order is the best order. And then as you go on, you find that there are other possibilities. I mean, the thing that sort of broke the film open for me was the character of Nicole, who hadn't really been in the movie prior. So there was this amazing scene in the, in the back end of the second half of the movie in the locker room where Thomas breaks down and tells the team about his daughter who died, you know, some years earlier. And we definitely wanted that to be a, a surprise to people, but it felt like, felt a little bit like it came out of nowhere and it felt like without some hint Thomas's character was just this kind of racist, misogynistic, homophobe, just this horrible, horrible guy, and you didn't have a, a kind of handle. So what really broke things for me was I realized that we had a couple of scenes where he was on the phone to Gail. We could, you know, voice the character of his daughter that he's listening to these messages. So I mentioned that because once those came in, it kind of shook up the structure of the movie. So you wanted to use those to kind of, you know, often we would come out of conflict between him and Jaya and we would go to those scenes and then we would try and use that to kind of propel him into some kind of change, whether it's turning up to practice for the first time or coming back to practice once he's thrown a tantrum and, and rejoining the team. You introduce something new like that and we also had pickups as well. Then structure is likely to want to shake up a little bit, I think. So you also mentioned the character of Jaya, a real person, the first transgender player to play in a World Cup game. That in and of itself is worthy of a story. I mean, you have a couple of movies you could have made from this one movie. Yeah. Knowing that, there's a challenge in balancing how much to lean into that story versus keeping it about the team as a whole. I really leaned into Jaya. I just thought that she was a very interesting character, but that was also the most interesting relationship in the movie was her and Thomas. And so when I got in, I just kind of threw everything that I could find of her into the movie. And that did, you know, we came back on that eventually. A couple of scenes came out. But part of my past was to try and make her almost a secondary protagonist, someone who really matters to the film. You know, the film is partly from her point of view and broadly from a Samoan point of view, as well as from Thomas's point of view. So I really leaned into her. And, you know, some of the other things were sort of making sure that his attitude towards her wasn't represented as the film's attitude towards her. Just very little things, like when he's having his kind of transphobic rant and talking about My Little Pony, cutting to some of the other team members and showing their kind of distaste and distrust of him gave you a perspective that this old white guy's perspective on um, a fa fa fine. It's not the perspective of the film. It's not the perspective of the team. And so some of it was just kind of framing her character a little bit. Well, on a similar note, and I think we also talked about this when we discussed The Heart of They Fall, the idea of making room for an ensemble cast. I mean, it's a big cast that comprises a whole soccer team and the tight-knit community of supporters that they have. You do your best to give all these characters their time and space. And to do that, sometimes you have to make sacrifices and lose great moments or performances. Tell me how you approach that aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, that's always tough with a big ensemble like this. Oscar's character, Tavita, was obviously really important. He's the guy who hires Thomas in the first place. He's the guy who has the problem of the worst soccer team in the world. So the movie really kind of starts with him in a way. And the other character that was going to be really, one of the other characters that was going to be really important to us was Nikki Salapu, who is the guy who led in 31 goals, but ultimately comes back to the team and turns out to be their savior. So it was making sure, I guess, that he was established just enough that it wouldn't be, there would still be a surprise when he came back into the movie, but it would be kind of a satisfying surprise and not like a complete wild card. There were so many good performers. It's always hard to give everyone their due, but it's a team movie and you kind of need all of those different characters, like Simu, who plays Rambo, who's a, a great comedic actor. I guess a lot of them just kind of buy their time on screen as well by being really great performers. 
Well, it is a sports comedy or a sport comedy, depending on what part of the world you're in. And so by the law of sports comedies, you are required to have an up-tempo training montage. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, Jesus Christ and Dolly Parton are influential figures in American Samoa. I don't think we ever get quite to the bottom of that in the movie. But as a result, the montage is done to the song 9 to 5. So I'd like to know how something like that is scripted and how much material are you actually given to create what ends up being a one to two minute sequence? Yeah, lots. I mean, the funny thing about that is Dolly wasn't in the movie. That used to be Elvis in those picture frames. It was Jesus and Elvis, who's definitely, uh, you know, a big character in the Pacific. But I auditioned so many tunes for both of those training montages and for the whole film. And there was just this kind of magic moment where I threw nine to five on and the lyrics, was it just another step on the boss man's ladder happened to be while they were doing the ladder sequence. And that man is out to get me happened to be when Thomas is giving Jaya kind of uh, evil look. And so it just felt like, you know, it had to be. And, and that's what you kind of hope for when you're syncing um, music, which we can talk about more in a minute. But in terms of material, yeah, there was a ton of material shot for both montages. I think it was always intended that there would be two. But what stuff winds up in which montage was really dependent on what story we were trying to tell. So the first montage is really about Thomas joining the team. And then the second montage, I guess, is about really, you know, accepting that he's part of the team and, and the team accepting him and going forward together. You know, so the first montage is the very typical kind of tough cop thing where he's being really tough on the players. And the second one, you know, he's kind of a little bit more part of the family. They're all working together. So you kind of caught lightning in a bottle there with the lyrics of 9 to 5 playing out perfectly against what's happening with the team. Yeah. Let's expand on that a little bit. What is Taika's process for needle drops? Is he very prescriptive about what tracks he wants? Does he leave it up to you entirely or to the music supervisor? How does that usually come about? On this one, he kind of left it up to me. I guess there'd been a few iterations. And, you know, one of the things that bothered me a little bit was there was no Samoa music. So... When I came on, you know, I really worked on the opening of the film, trying to bring, you know, there's the Jeremy Gray tune, We Are Samoa, that plays over that opening montage. Almost feels like a national anthem and kind of cuts beautifully, ironically, against them being smashed by Australia. And then the Liao tune, Musica Malie, which is like a massively covered song in Samoa and throughout the Pacific. So it's a really well-known song, but Finding a kind of really upbeat version of that was tough. And that came out of a, like a Radio New Zealand live to air. Five stars, you know, there were all these great groups from Samoa from the 70s and 80s that kind of felt like they resonated with Taika's style, his tone. So I think for me, anytime I work with a director, I treat them as a genre and I try and figure out what the tone of that genre is. And that was part of the brief was to make the movie feel more Taika. I think music played a really big part in that. Everybody Wants to Rule the World was actually like an old idea that I was trying to get into Jojo Rabbit with the kind of training montage in that movie. So it was kind of a recycled idea that came back later. Well, let's talk about score a little bit and working with composer Michael Giacchino. When you are joining a film in progress, how does that change, if at all, the way you work with a composer? That seems like something where you meet early on and you have some discussions and everyone goes off and does their thing and comes back and does the sessions and the mixes and everyone's happy. But if you're coming in and out of a film, how does that change how you interact with the composer? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a ton of interaction with Michael compared to Jojo Rabbit, you know, where I was on from beginning to end of the film. And we would go out to his studio and listen to demos and give a little feedback. With this one, by the time I came on, there was actually a fair bit of score done. So the whole back end of the movie, the score was working really beautifully. I guess the only thing that I did that was, you know, maybe a bit delicate was replacing score sometimes with needle drops early on, as we were just discussing, to kind of give the film more of a Samoan film feel. That was probably my only kind of net effect on score was like removing some of it. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. I think he'll get over it. I think he's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing okay. He's actually directing now, too. Yeah, yeah, I want to see that. have to get him back on again. You know, you're not the only one active on social media with elements of the projects you're working on. In 2019, Taika tweeted, let's see if I get this quote right, Happy Halloween. I'm in this nightmare hellscape of my own creation, and it's called Still Finishing a Script Three Days Before Principal Photography. I hope you enjoy your dumb parties. You will be forgotten, whereas I will be immortalized in a book about Kiwi filmmakers active between 2005 and 2020. 
which he followed up with a pumpkin emoji. <laughs> you kind of already answered this question, but I thought we could just explore it a little more. Knowing that he's still writing the script a few days before the film actually begins shooting, the question was, does he allow for a lot of improv, which you said he clearly does. So how do you manage something like that? First of all, do you appreciate it and that it gives you a lot more choices? Or is it just a little more cumbersome if everyone's going off and riffing? Yeah, I mean, it can be both. I think my first response and probably a lot of editors' first response is to get very excited about the improv because it's new. You never saw that line coming. So it's kind of like opening up a box of chocolates or a little gift every morning when you get your dailies. So it's very tempting to kind of really push the improv. But oftentimes you find the scripted stuff, if they ever do the script, tells the story a little bit more succinctly. So the challenge with improv is always to keep the story moving and make sure it says the things that it's supposed to say. You know, sometimes you find there are incredible improvs, but they don't go anywhere. You know, you get a great improv on one side and you don't have any response or reaction on the other side of it. So it's kind of like a pick a path novel. I guess I start out by throwing the things that I like in a timeline and I'm really then on the lookout for things that will make that improv work and tell the story that needs to be told. You mentioned that there were two montages and it reminded me of just the challenge of cutting action in a sport, you know, the blocking of a soccer match and how something like that might be shot. I wonder how tightly constructed it is during production and how much of a challenge it is in post where like you're trying to find these things that match and it just never really matched on the day when they shot it. Yeah, I mean, a bit of both. You know, there was beats that they really tried to get. And then there was a lot of just wild play, football play. You know, often the key beat on the ball would be shot and then finding kind of reactions or movements that might lead up to that was the puzzle. Even going back to, you know, some of the practice matches. So you kind of had the key moments and then you had to construct around them. So I wonder how much of this might be done digitally, because when I talked to the editors of Ted Lasso, they mentioned, well, we have to put the soccer ball in sometimes to make it work digitally. Is anything like that here? Is everything practical? Only occasionally. The two examples that I can think of, one was the kind of stunt where a couple of players get hit in the head by the ball and it kind of ricochets in a way that you could never. It would have been like a hundred takes to <laughs> try and a few head injuries and a few lawsuits, I think. So that one was digital. And the only other one that was kind of digitally assisted was the ball crawling across the line for, I think maybe it's the first goal of, of the final match where it just um, ekes across the line. And again, getting that right on the day, I think they had a good go at it, but um you know, getting it to time in exactly the right way was definitely digitally assisted. We spend a lot of time generally in these interviews talking about the openings of films, and with good reason. That's a big challenge for any film. The way you ended this film, I found to be kind of unique. Usually the endings of these movies, there are some tropes or cliches that often come up. I thought what you did was a little bit counter to what we've come to expect in traditional sports movies. You see the team's tying goal. We do see that. But then we do sort of a flash forward to the son telling his father what happened. And then we're seeing some of those scenes. And then you're also flashing forward further into the future to the players as much older people telling the story to their children or grandchildren as to what happened. So instead of this very traditional, big, glorious ending to the match, you do some really interesting things structure wise and how you tell the story. Tell me about how that all happened. I can't tell you too much about that because that really wasn't my work. The match worked really well when I came on board. There are a couple of things that just sung, and one was the whole gameplay sequence, and the other one was that locker room speech that I was talking about. And so really my role was to go back and kind of earn all of that and make sure the first half of the movie delivered you there. But kudos to Taika and the whole editing team who came before me for piecing that together because it just worked. And I think, you know, when something works, I usually <laughs> leave it alone. If it ain't broke. I do want to bring you back to an interview that I read where you once compared James Samuels to Quentin Tarantino in terms of them both being what you called black belt level cinema nerds. And it did make me wonder how Taika compares with that. Is he big on giving reference points for his movies or is he very much, this is the material that I've written and this is where we're staying and this is the story I'm trying to tell. You don't need to go look anywhere else for reference other than the documentary in this case. 
I mean, he's definitely a big time cinema nerd and, you know, knows about different pockets of cinema that I know nothing about, you know, like Korean cinema or something. There wasn't a lot of talk about references. There's, there's the obvious kind of sports movie references for this film. But for me, I didn't really want to make a typical sports movie. So if anything, I was trying to make a more emotional version of the movie. So there wasn't so much kind of studying of films. I think also because I was just coming on for a pass and, you know, I had a fairly brief amount of time. I wasn't really trying to dig into, you know, all of the permutations of what a sports movie is, because as a sports movie, it was kind of working. It was really as an emotional story that I was kind of doing a bit more lifting. So you might not have been around for this, but maybe you heard anecdotally, you said that as a sports movie, it's working. And then we've got to make sure as a comedy and as an emotional story, it works as well. Were you aware of any feedback from audiences that saw the screenings, whether it's to vet the comedy or just to make sure that the emotional beats are resonating? Um, I'm not sure how much I can talk about scores and stuff, but it definitely bumped up when we found that kind of emotional heart, emotional backbone of the film and gave Thomas some dimension and wrote in those messages from his daughter. The film seemed to lift, you know, I'm not big on scores, but I am big on sitting in the room with an audience. And I think you can feel when it's working and, and not working. Certainly with comedy, it's easy. They laugh or they don't laugh. But I think also, if you're lucky, you get a few gasps, you know, on a story reveal. But if not, you can still kind of feel whether it's landing or not. And so feedback, I think, was good live in the room at the moment. You know, we've done two interviews now. I don't recall asking you this or not, but just meeting Taika for the first time, I don't recall what the origin story was with you and Taika. And if you are game, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I mean, the first time I met Taika, he was just in my house. He was sleeping on my couch. It was those kind of days of loose, wild up partying. And he was also a, a dude who I think, you know, in his early days, he's making a lot of movies and doing his comedy and sleeping on a lot of couches. So I think probably a lot of people have that story. But really, I got to know him through my wife, Danelle, who is a makeup and hair designer on a bunch of his movies from Boy through Jojo Rabbit. And it was when they were working together on Boy that they were hanging out around the house prepping that movie and that's when I got to know him and I wound up doing trailers for that movie and going to some screenings of it and giving some notes and that was kind of the first contact the first first thing I did I know you said that you feel like you can be a little more blunt a little more direct but otherwise is there anything that's changed in the way you two work over these past 10 years Yeah I mean I was thinking about it when you're asking about um you know influences and stuff uh we probably talk less <laughs> these <laughs> days. You know what I mean? Like we kind of, I, I think I know his tone, which is not to say that it doesn't switch up with every movie and, and evolve and grow, but it's fairly kind of shorthand these days. And I think sometimes the, the best way at it is just to do it and try things. And I show him stuff and it sticks or it doesn't, but there's not so much kind of strategizing before we go into something. It's very much just, you know, do you like it? Yes. Great. No, let's try again. That's really all you got to do. Yeah. I've grown fond of asking editors this question, maybe too much, but I feel like every project you do, you should walk away learning something. I know this is a little bit of a different project for you in terms of your involvement, but was there anything you take away with you from doing Next Goal Wins? What did you learn on this project? Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess I maybe learned that American Samoa is a territory of the United States. I don't know. The American part didn't tip you off? Yeah. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a state. It's kind of like Puerto Rico, right? But yeah, I don't know. I'm trying, I'm struggling to think what I learned. I don't think we want to take this into a geography lesson. I don't think either one of us would do very well. <laughs> no. Yeah, who cares about geography? The only geography you care about in editing is where the characters are in a scene. As always, it was a pleasure to have Tom Eagles on the show. A big thank you to him for coming on the podcast today on behalf of the editing team for Next Goal Wins. Go see it with someone you love. Do everything with someone you love. It makes life that much better. Something I know you will love are the great new features in Avid Media Composer. AI-enhanced versions of script sync and phrase find, sequence templates, batch subclipping, audio punching over USB devices, and much more. Plus, this time of year, there are usually some nice deals. You know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Timeline Tuesday, all that stuff. In light of that, there's a link in the show notes that will take you right to any special offers that may be in effect for the holidays. Speaking of the holidays, here in the U.S., we celebrate Thanksgiving. So to all of you, I wish you a happy and restful Thanksgiving. 
But no matter where you live, I hope you can spend a little extra time with family and friends and be thankful for all that you have. I am always thankful that you take the time to listen to this podcast and even say hi every once in a while. If you listen and you like them, well, I'll do my best to keep making them. So until the next one, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.